Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com, where you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more. Coming up in this episode, it's Thriller Thursday, so tonight you'll be hearing a story of fiction. I've been on an old-time radio kick recently, listening to shows like The Whistler, Dimension X, and Strange Tales. One of my favorite shows is called X-1. It was a half-hour science fiction radio drama series that was broadcast from April 24, 1955 to January 9, 1958, in various time slots on NBC Radio. At the end of each episode, they tell you where the stories they used come from before they adapted them for radio, and one of those sources was the publication Astounding Science Fiction Magazine. Well, I jumped online to see if maybe there were some old copies that I could look at, and I found a book, an anthology of many of the stories from that magazine. The book was published in 1954. The story was titled First Contact, written by Murray Leinster in 1945. The story is credited as one of the first instances of a universal translator in science fiction. So influential is the story that it won a Retro Hugo Award for Best Novelette in 1996. The book I was able to purchase online has seen better days, as it apparently went straight to the Sheffield City Libraries and was checked out numerous times, almost immediately after it was turned in by the previous reader. You can see that by the dates stamped on the inside, so get ready for a little sci-fi fun. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Tommy Dort went into the captain's room with his last pair of stereo photos and said, "'I'm through, sir. These are the last two pictures I can take.' He handed over the photographs and looked with professional interest at the visit plates, which showed all space outside the ship. Subdued, deep red lighting indicated the controls and such instruments as the quartermaster on duty needed for navigation of the spaceship Lonvabon. There was a deeply cushioned control chair. There was the little gadget of oddly angled mirrors, remote descendant of the back view mirrors of 20th century motorists, which allowed a view of all the visit plates without turning the head. And then there were the huge plates, which were so much more satisfactory for a direct view of space. The Landvabon was a long way from home. The plates, which showed every star of visual magnitude and could be stepped up to any desired magnification, portrayed stars of every imaginable degree of brilliance in the startlingly different colors they show outside of atmosphere. But every one was unfamiliar. Only two constellations could be recognized as seen from Earth, and they were shrunken and distorted. The Milky Way seemed vaguely out of place. But even such oddities were minor compared to a sight in the forward plates. There was a vast, vast mistiness ahead a luminous mist. It seemed motionless. It took a long time for any appreciable nearing to appear in the vision plates, though the spaceship's velocity indicator showed an incredible speed. The mist was the Crab Nebula, six light years long, three and a half light years thick, with outward-reaching members that in the telescopes of Earth gave it some resemblance to the creature for which it was named. 
it was a cloud of gas, infinitely tenuous, reaching half again as far as from Sol to its nearest neighbor sun. Deep within it burned two stars, a double star, one component the familiar yellow of the sun of Earth, the other an unholy white. Tommy Dort said meditatively, "'We're heading into a, a deep, sir?' The skipper studied the last two plates of Tommy's taking and put them aside. He went back to his uneasy contemplation of the vision plates ahead. The Lonvabon was decelerating at full force. She was a bare half-light year from the nebula. Tommy's work was guiding the ship's course now, but the work was done. During all the stay of the exploring ship in the nebula, Tommy Dort would loaf. But he'd more than paid his way so far. He had just completed a quite unique first, a complete photographic record of the movement of a nebula during a period of 4,000 years, taken by one individual with the same apparatus and with control exposures to detect and record any systematic errors. But in addition, he had also recorded 4,000 years of the history of a double star, and 4,000 years of the history of a star in the act of degenerating into a white dwarf. It was not that Tommy Dort was 4,000 years old. He was actually in his 20s. But the Crab Nebula is 4,000 light years from Earth, and the last two pictures had been taken by a light which would not reach Earth until the 6th millennium AD. On the way here, at speeds incredible multiples of the speed of light, Tommy Dort had recorded each aspect of the nebula by the light which had left it from 40 centuries since to a bare six months ago. The Lanvabon bored on through space, slowly, slowly, slowly. The incredible luminosity crept across the vision plates. It blotted out half the universe from view. Before was glowing mist, and behind was a star-studded emptiness. The mist shut off three-fourths of all the stars. Some few of the brightest shone dimly through it near its edge, but only a few. Then there was only an irregular-shaped patch of darkness astern against which stars shone, unwinking. The Lanvabon dived into the nebula, and it seemed as if it bored into a tunnel of darkness with walls of shining fog, which was exactly what the spaceship was doing. The most distant photographs of all had disclosed structural features in the nebula. It was not amorphous. It had form. As the Lanvabon drew nearer, indications of structure grew more distinct, and Tommy Dort had argued for a curved approach for photographic reasons. So the spaceship had come up to the nebula on a vast logarithmic curve, and Tommy had been able to take successive photographs from slightly different angles and get stereo pairs which showed the nebula in three dimensions, which disclosed billowings and hollows and an actually complicated shape. In places, the nebula displayed convolutions like those of a human brain. It was into one of those hollows that the spaceship now plunged. They had been called deeps by analogy with crevices in the ocean floor, and they promised to be useful. The skipper relaxed. One of the skipper's functions nowadays is to think of things to worry about, and then worry about them. The skipper of the Lanvabon was conscientious. Only after a certain instrument remained definitely not registering did he ease himself back in his seat. It was just barely possible, he said heavily, that those deeps might be non-luminous gas. But they're empty, so we'll be able to use overdrive as long as we're in them. It was a light year and a half from the edge of the nebula to the neighborhood of the double star which was at its heart. That was the problem. A nebula is a gas. It is so thin that a comet's tail is solid by comparison, but a ship traveling on overdrive, above the speed of light, does not want to hit even a merely hard vacuum. It needs pure emptiness, such as exists between the stars. But the Lanvabon could not do much in this expanse of mist if it was limited to speeds a merely hard vacuum will permit. The luminosity seemed to close in behind the spaceship, which slowed and slowed and slowed. The overdrive went off with the sudden pinging sensation which goes all over a person when the overdrive field is released. Then, almost instantly, bells burst into clanging, strident uproar all through the ship. 
Tommy was almost deafened by the alarm bell which rang in the captain's room before the quartermaster shut it off with a flip of his hand. But other bells could be heard ringing throughout the rest of the ship to be cut off as automatic doors closed one by one. Tommy Dort stared at the skipper. The skipper's hands clenched. He was up and staring over the quartermaster's shoulder. One indicator was apparently having convulsions. Others strained to record their findings. A spot on the diffusedly bright mistiness of a bow quartering visiplate grew brighter as the automatic scanner focused on it. That was the direction of the object which had sounded collision alarm. But the object locator itself, according to its reading, there was one solid object some 80,000 miles away, an object of no great size. But there was another object whose distance varied from extreme range to zero and whose size shared its impossible advance and retreat. "'Step up the scanner!' snapped the skipper. The extra bright spot on the scanner rolled outward, obliterating the undifferentiated image behind it. Magnification increased, but nothing appeared, absolutely nothing. Yet the radio locator insisted that something monstrous and invisible made lunatic dashes towards the Lanvaban, at speeds which inevitably implied collision and then fled coyly away at the same rate. The visiplate went up to maximum magnification. Still, nothing. The skipper ground his teeth. Tommy Dort said meditatively, "'Do you know, sir, I saw something like this on a linear on the Earth-Mars run once when we were being located by another ship. Their locator beam was the same frequency as ours, and every time it hit, it registered like something monstrous and solid.' "'That,' said the skipper savagely, is just what's happening now. There's something like a locator beam on us. We're getting that beam and our own echo besides. But the other ship's invisible. Who is out here in an invisible ship with locator devices? Not men, certainly. He pressed the button in his sleeve communicator and snapped. Action! Stations! Man all weapons! Condition of extreme alert in all departments immediately! His hand closed and unclosed. He stared again at the visiplate, which showed nothing but a formless brightness. Not men, Tommy Dort straightened sharply. You mean... How many solar systems in our galaxy? demanded the skipper bitterly. How many planets fit for life? And how many kinds of life could there be? If this ship isn't from Earth, and it isn't, it has a crew that isn't human. And things that aren't human, but are up to the level of deep space travel in their civilization, could mean anything. Skipper's hands were actually shaking. He would not have talked so freely before a member of his own crew, but Tommy Dort was of the observation staff, and even a skipper whose duties include worrying may sometimes need desperately to unload his worries. Sometimes, too, it helps to think aloud. "'Something like this has been talked about and speculated about for years,' he said softly. "'Mathematically, it's been an odds-on bet that somewhere in our galaxy there'd be another race with a civilization equal to or further advanced than ours. Nobody could ever guess where or when we'd meet them, but it looks like we've done it now. Tommy's eyes were very bright. Do you suppose they'll be friendly, sir? The skipper glanced at the distance indicator. The phantom object still made its insane, non-existent swoops towards and away from the Lanvabon. The secondary indication of an object at 80,000 miles stirred ever so slightly. "'It's moving,' he said curtly, heading for us. "'Just what we'd do if a strange spaceship appeared in our hunting grounds. Friendly? Maybe. We're going to try and contact them. We, we have to, but I suspect that this is the end of the expedition. Thank God for the blasters.' The blasters are those beams of ravening destruction which take care of recalcitrant meteorites in a spaceship's course when the deflectors can't handle them. They're not designed as weapons, but they can serve as pretty good ones. They can go into action at 5,000 miles and draw on the entire power output of a whole ship. With automatic aim and a traverse of 5 degrees, a ship like the Lanvabon can come very close to blasting a hole through a small-sized asteroid which gets in its way, but not on overdrive, of course.
Tommy Dorn had approached the bow quartering visiplate. Now he jerked his head around. Blasters, sir, what for? The skipper grimaced at the empty visiplate. Because we don't know what they're like and can't take a chance. I know, he added bitterly. We're going to make contacts and try to find out all we can about them, especially where they come from. I suppose we'll try to make friends, but we haven't much chance. We can't trust them the fraction of an inch. We daren't. They've locators. Maybe they've tracers better than any we have. Maybe they could trace us all the way home without our knowing it. We can't risk a non-human race knowing where Earth is unless we're sure of them. And how can we be sure? They could come to trade, of course, or they could swoop down on overdrive with a battle fleet that could wipe us out before we knew what happened. We wouldn't know which to expect or when. Tommy's face was startled. It's all been thrashed out over and over in theory, said the skipper. Nobody has ever been able to find a sound answer, even on paper. But you know, in all their theorizing, no one considered the crazy, rank impossibility of a deep space contact, with neither side knowing the other's home world. But we got to find an answer, in fact. What are we going to do about them? Maybe these creatures will be aesthetic marvels, nice and friendly and polite, and underneath with the sneaking brutal ferocity of a Japanese. Or maybe they'll be crude and gruff as a Swedish farmer and just as decent underneath. Maybe there's something in between. But am I going to risk the possible future of the human race on a guess that it's safe to trust them? God knows it'd be worthwhile to make friends with a new civilization. It'd be bound to stimulate our own, and maybe we'd gain enormously, but I can't take chances. The one thing I won't risk is having them know how to find Earth. Either I know they can't follow me, or I don't go home, and they'll probably feel the same way. He pressed the sleeve communicator button again. Navigation officers, attention! Every star map on this ship is to be prepared for instant destruction. This includes photographs and diagrams from which our course or starting point can be deduced. I want all astronomical data gathered and arranged to be destroyed in a split second on order. Make it fast and report when it's ready." He released the button. He looked suddenly old. The first contact of humanity with an alien race was a situation which had been foreseen in many fashions, but never one quite so hopeless of a solution as this. A solitary Earth ship and a solitary alien meeting in a nebula which must be remote from the home planet of each. They might wish peace, but the line of conduct which best prepared a treacherous attack was just the seeming of friendliness. Failure to be suspicious might doom the human race, and a peaceful exchange of the fruits of civilization would be the greatest benefit imaginable. Any mistake would be irreparable, but a failure to be on guard would be fatal. The captain's room was very, very quiet. The bow quartering visiplate was filled with the image of a very small section of the nebula. A very small section, indeed. It was all diffused, featureless, luminous mist. But suddenly Tommy Dort pointed. There, sir! There was a small shape in the mist. It was far away. It was a black shape, not polished to mirror reflection like the hull of the Lanvabon. It was bulbous, roughly pear-shaped. There was much thin luminosity between, and no details could be observed, but it was surely no natural object. Then Tommy looked at the distance indicator and said quietly, "'It's headed for us at a very high acceleration, sir. The odds are that they're thinking the same thing, sir, that neither of us will dare let the other go home. Do you think they'll try uh, contact with us or let loose with their weapons as soon as they're in range?' The Londobon was no longer in a crevice of emptiness in the nebula's thin substance. She swam in luminescence. There were no stars save the two fierce glows in the nebula's heart. There was nothing but an all-enveloping light, curiously like one's imagining of underwater in the tropics of Earth. The alien ship had made one sign of less than lethal intention. As it drew near the Londobon, it decelerated. The Lanvabon itself had advanced for a meeting and then come to a dead stop. Its movement had been a recognition of the nearness of the other ship. 
Its pausing was both a friendly sign and a precaution against attack. Relatively still, it could swivel on its own axis to present the least target to a slashing assault, and it would have a longer firing time than if the two ships flashed past each other at their combined speeds. The moment of actual approach, however, was tenseness itself. The Lanvaban's needle-pointed bow aimed unwaveringly at the alien bulk. A relay to the captain's room put a key under his hand which would fire the blasters with maximum power. Tommy Dort watched, his brow wrinkled. The aliens must be of a high degree of civilization if they had spaceships, and civilization does not develop without the development of foresight. These aliens must recognize all the implications of this first contact of two civilized races as fully as did the humans on the Lanvaban. The possibility of an enormous spurt in the development of both by peaceful contact and exchange of their separate technologies would probably appeal to them as to the men. But when dissimilar human cultures are in contact, one must usually be subordinate or there is war. A subordination between races arising on separate planets could not be peacefully arranged. Men, at least, would never consent to subordination, nor was it likely that any highly developed race would agree. The benefits to be derived from commerce could never make up for a condition of inferiority. Some races, men perhaps, would prefer commerce to conquest. Perhaps, perhaps these aliens would also. But some types even of human beings would have craved red war. If the alien ship now approaching the Lanvaban returned to its home base with news of humanity's existence and of ships like the Lanvaban, it would give its race the choice of trade or battle. They might want trade, or they might want war. But it takes two to make trade and only one to make war. They could not be sure of men's peacefulness, nor could men be sure of theirs. The only safety for either civilization would lie in the destruction of one or both of the two ships here and now. But even victory would not be really enough. Men would need to know where this alien race was to be found, for avoidance if not for battle. They would need to know its weapons and its resources and if it could be a menace and how it could be eliminated in case of need. The aliens would feel the same necessities concerning humanity. So the skipper of the Lanvaban did not press the key which might possibly have blasted the other ship to nothingness. He dared not. But he dared not fire either. Sweat came out on his face. A speaker muttered, someone from the range room, "'The other ship's stopped, sir. Quite stationary. Blasters are centered on it, sir.' It was an urging to fire, but the skipper shook his head to himself. The alien ship was no more than twenty miles away. It was dead black. Every bit of its exterior was an abysmal, non-reflecting sable. No details could be seen except by minor variations in its outline against the misty nebula. "'It stopped dead, sir,' said another voice. "'They sent a modulated shortwave at us, sir. Frequently modulated. Apparently a signal.' not enough power to do any harm. The skipper said through tight-locked teeth, they're doing something now. There's movement on the outside of their hull. Watch what comes out. Put the auxiliary blasters on it. Something small and round came smoothly out of the oval outline of the black ship. The bulbous hulk moved. Moving away, sir, said the speaker. The object they let out is stationary in the place they've left. Another voice cut in. More frequency moderated stuff, sir. Unintelligible. Tommy Dort's eyes brightened. The skipper watched the visiplate with sweat droplets on his forehead. Rather pretty, sir, said Tommy meditatively. If they sent anything towards us, it might seem a projectile or a bomb. So they came close, let out a lifeboat, and went away again. They figure we could send a boat or a man to make contact without risking our ship. They must think pretty much as we do. The skipper said without moving his eyes from the plate, Mr. Dort, would you care to go out and look the thing over? I can't order you, but I need all my operating crews for emergencies. 
the observation staff. It's expendable. Very well, sir, said Tommy briskly. I won't take a lifeboat, sir, just a suit with a drive in it. It's smaller, and the arms and legs will look unsuitable for a bomb. I think I should carry a scanner, sir. The alien ship continued to retreat. Forty, eighty, four hundred miles. It came to a stop and hung there, waiting. Climbing into his atomic-driven spacesuit just within the Lanvabon's airlock, Tommy heard the reports as they went over the speakers throughout the ship. That the other ship had stopped its retreat at 400 miles was encouraging. It might not have weapons effective at a greater distance than that, and so felt safe. But just as the thought formed itself in his mind, the alien retreated precipitously still farther, which, as Tommy reflected as he emerged from the lock, might be because the aliens had realized they were giving themselves away, or might be because they wanted to give the impression that they had done so. He swooped away from the silvery mirror Lanvabon through a brightly glowing emptiness which was past any previous experience of the human race. Behind him, the Lanvabon swung about and darted away. The skipper's voice came in Tommy's helmet phones. We're pulling back too, Mr. Dort. There's a bare possibility that they've some explosive atomic reaction that they can't use from their own ship, but which might be destructive, even as far as this. We'll draw back. Keep your scanner on the object. The reasoning was sound, if not very comforting. Explosive, which would destroy anything within 20 miles, was theoretically possible, but humans didn't have it yet. It was decidedly safest for the Lanvabon to draw back. But Tommy Dort felt very lonely. He sped through emptiness towards the tiny black speck which hung in incredible brightness. The Lanvabon vanished. Its polished hull would merge with the glowing mist at a relatively short distance anyhow. The alien ship was not visible to the naked eye either. Tommy swam in nothingness, 4,000 light years from home, towards a tiny black spot which was the only solid object to be seen in all of space. It was a slightly distorted sphere, not much over six feet in diameter. It bounced away when Tommy landed on it feet first. There were small tentacles or horns which projected in every direction. They looked rather like the detonating horns of a submarine mine, but there was a glint of crystal at the tip end of each. I'm here, said Tommy into his helmet phone. He caught hold of a horn and drew himself to the object. It was all metal dead black. He could feel no texture through his space gloves, of course, but he went over and over it, trying to discover its purpose. Deadlock, sir, he said presently. Nothing to report that the scanner hasn't shown you. Then, through his suit, he felt vibrations. They translated themselves as clankings. The section of the rounded hull of the object opened out. Two sections, he worked his way around to look in and see the first non-human civilized beings that any man had ever looked upon. But what he saw was simply a flat plate on which dim red glows crawled here and there in seeming aimlessness. His helmet phones emitted a startled exclamation, the skipper's voice. Very good, Mr. Dort. Fix your scanner to look into that plate. They dumped out a robot with an infrared visiplate for communication not risking any personnel. Whatever we might do would damage only machinery. Maybe they expect us to bring it on board, and it may have a bomb charge that can be detonated when they're ready to start for home. I'll send a plate to face one of its scanners. You return to the ship. Yes, sir, said Tommy. But which way is the ship, sir? There were no stars. The nebula obscured them with its light. The only thing visible from the robot was the double star at the nebula's center. Tommy was no longer oriented. He had but one reference point. Head straight away from the double star, came the order in his helmet phone. We'll pick you up. He passed another lonely figure a little later, headed for the alien sphere with a vision plate to set up. The two spaceships, each knowing that it dared not risk its own race by the slightest lack of caution, would communicate with each other through this small, round robot. Their separate vision systems would enable them to exchange all the information they dared give. 
While they debated the most practical way of making sure that their own civilization would not be endangered by this first contact with another, the truly most practical method would be the destruction of the other ship in a swift and deadly attack in self-defense. I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like Cognizine Cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. The Lanvaban thereafter was a ship in which there were two separate Enterprises on hand at the same time. She had come out from Earth to make close-range observations on the smaller component of the double star at the nebula's center. The nebula itself was the result of the most titanic explosion of which men have any knowledge. The explosion took place sometime in the year 2946 BC, before the first of the seven cities of long-dead Ilium was even thought of. The light of that explosion reached Earth in the year AD 1054 and was duly recorded in ecclesiastic annals and somewhat more reliably by Chinese court astronomers. It was bright enough to be seen in daylight for 23 successive days. Its light, and it was 4,000 light-years away, was brighter than that of Venus. From these facts, astronomers could calculate 900 years later the violence of the detonation. Matter blown away from the center of the explosion would have traveled outward at the rate of 2,300,000 miles an hour, more than 38,000 miles a minute, something over 638 miles per second. When 20th century telescopes were turned upon the scene of this vast explosion, only a double star remained, and the nebula. The brighter star of the doublet was almost unique in having so high a surface temperature that it showed no spectrum lines at all it had a continuous spectrum. Sol's surface temperature is about 7,000 degrees, absolute. That of the hot white star is 500,000 degrees. It has nearly the mass of the Sun, but only one-fifth its diameter, so that its density is 173 times that of water, 16 times that of lead, and 8 times that of iridium, the heaviest substance known on Earth. But even this density is not that of a dwarf white star like the companion of Sirius. The white star in the Crab Nebula is an incomplete dwarf. It is a star still in the act of collapsing. Examination, including the survey of a 4,000-year column of its light, was worthwhile. The Lanvabon had come to make that examination. But the finding of an alien spaceship upon a similar errand had implications which overshadowed the original purpose of the expedition a tiny, bulbous robot floated in the tenuous nebular gas. The normal operating crew of the Lanvaban stood at their posts with a sharp alertness which was productive of tense nerves. The observation staff divided itself, and a part went half-heartedly about the making of the observations for which the Lanvaban had come. The other half applied itself to the problem the spaceship offered. It represented a culture which was up to space travel on an interstellar scale, 
The explosion of a mere 5,000 years since must have blasted every trace of life out of existence in the area now filled by the nebula. So the aliens of the black spaceship came from another solar system. Their trip must have been like that of the Earth ship for purely scientific purposes. There was nothing to be extracted from the nebula. They were then at least near the level of human civilization, which meant that they had or could develop arts and articles of commerce which men would want to trade for, in friendship. But they would necessarily realize that the existence and civilization of humanity was a potential menace to their own race. The two races could be friends, but also they could be deadly enemies. Each, even if unwillingly, was a monstrous menace to the other, and the only safe thing to do with a menace is to destroy it. In the Crab Nebula, the problem was acute and immediate. The future relationship of the two races would be settled here and now. If a process for friendship could be established, one race, otherwise doomed, would survive and both would benefit immensely. But that process had to be established and confidence built up without the most minute risk of danger from treachery confidence would need to be established upon a foundation of necessarily complete distrust. Neither dared return to its own base if the other could do harm to its race. Neither dared risk any of the necessities to trust. The only safe thing for either to do was destroy the other or be destroyed. But even for war, more was needed than mere destruction of the other. With interstellar traffic, the aliens must have atomic power and some form of overdrive for travel above the speed of light. With radio location and visiplates and shortwave communication they had, of course, many other devices. What weapons did they have? How widely extended was their culture? What were their resources? Could there be a development of trade and friendship, or were the two races so unlike that only war could exist between them? If peace was possible, how could it be begun? The men of Alonvaban needed facts, and so did the crew of the other ship. They must take back every morsel of information they could. The most important information of all would be of the location of the other's civilization, just in case of war. That one bit of information might be the decisive factor in an interstellar war, but other facts would be enormously valuable. The tragic thing was that there could be no possible information which could lead to peace. Neither ship could stake its own race's existence upon any conviction of the good will or the honor of the other. So there was a strange truce between the two ships. The alien went about its work of making observations, as did the Lanvaban. The tiny robot floated in bright emptiness. A scanner from the Lanvaban was focused upon a vision plate from the alien, a scanner from the alien regarded a vision plate from the Lanvaban. Communications began. It progressed rapidly. Tommy Dort was one of those who made the first progress report. His special task on the expedition was over. He had now been assigned to work on the problem of communication with the alien entities. He went with the ship's solitary psychologist to the captain's room to convey the news of success. The captain's room, as usual, was a place of silence and dull red indicator lights and the great bright visiplates on every wall and on the ceiling. "'We've established fairly satisfactory communication, sir,' said the psychologist. He looked tired. His work on the trip was supposed to be that of measuring personal factors of error in the observation staff for the reduction of all observations to the nearest possible decimal to the absolute. He had been pressed into service for which he was not especially fitted, and it told upon him. That is, we can say almost anything we wish to them and could understand what they say in return, but of course we don't know how much of what they say is the truth. Skipper's eyes turned to Tommy Dort. We've hooked up some machinery, said Tommy. That amounts to a mechanical translator. We have vision plates, of course, and then shortwave beams direct. 
They use frequency modulation plus what is probably variation in waveforms, like our vowel and consonant sounds in speech. We've never had any use for anything like that before, so our coils won't handle it, but we've developed a sort of code which isn't the language of either set of us. They shoot over shortwave stuff with frequency modulation and we record it as sound. When we shoot it back, it's reconverted into frequency modulation. The skipper said frowning, why waveform changes in short waves? How do you know? We showed them our recorder in the vision plates and they showed us theirs. They record the frequency modulation direct, I think, said Tommy carefully. They don't use sound at all, even in speech. They've set up a communications room and we've watched them in the act of communicating with us. They make no perceptible movement of anything that corresponds to a speech organ. Instead of a microphone, they simply stand near something that would work as a pickup antenna. My guess, sir, is that they use microwaves for what you might call person-to-person -person conversation. I think they make shortwave trains as we make sounds." The skipper stared at him. That means they have telepathy. Mm, yes, sir, said Tommy. Also, it means that we have telepathy, too, as far as they are concerned. They're probably deaf. They've certainly no idea of using sound waves in air for communications. They simply don't use noises for any purpose. The skipper stored the information away. What else? Well, sir, said Tommy doubtfully, I think we're all set. We agree on arbitrary symbols for objects, sir, by way of the visiplates and worked out relationships and verbs and, and so on that have mutual meanings. We set up an analyzer to sort out their shortwave groups, which we feed into a decoding machine. And then the coding end of the machine picks out recordings to make the wave groups we want to send back. When you're ready to talk to the skipper of the other ship, I think we're ready. Hmm. What's your impression of their psychology? The skipper asked the question of the psychologist. I don't know, sir, said the psychologist harassedly. They seem to be completely direct, but they haven't let slip even a hint of the tenseness we know exists. They act as if they were simply setting up a means of communication for friendly conversation. But there is, well, an overtone. The psychologist was a good man at psychological mensuration, which is a good and useful field, but he was not equipped to analyze a completely alien thought pattern. If I may say so, sir, said Tommy uncomfortably. What? They're oxygen breathers, said Tommy, and they're not too dissimilar to us in other ways. It seems to me, sir, that parallel evolution has been at work. Perhaps intelligence evolves in parallel lines, just as well, basic bodily functions. I mean, he added conscientiously, any living being of any sort must ingest, metabolize, and excrete. Perhaps any intelligent brain must perceive, apperceive, and find a personal reaction. I'm sure I've detected irony. That implies humor, too. In short, sir, I think they could be likable. The skipper heaved himself to his feet. Hmm, he said profoundly. We'll see what they have to say. He walked to the communications room. The scanner for the vision plate and the robot was in readiness. The skipper walked in front of it. Tommy Dort sat down at the coding machine and tapped at the keys. Highly improbable noises came from it, went into a microphone, and governed the frequency modulation of a signal sent through space to the other spaceship. Almost instantly, the vision screen, which with one relay in the robot, showed the interior of the other ship lighted up, an alien came before the scanner and seemed to look inquisitively out of the plate. He was extraordinarily manlike, but he was not human. The impression he gave was of extreme baldness and a somehow humorous frankness. I'd like to say, said the skipper heavily, the appropriate things about this first contact of two dissimilar civilized races, and of my hopes that a friendly intercourse between the two peoples will result. Tommy Dort hesitated. Then he shrugged and tapped expertly upon the coder. 
more improbable noises. The alien skipper seemed to receive the message. He made a gesture which was wryly assenting. The decoder on the Londobon hummed to itself and word cards dropped into the message frame. Tommy said dispassionately, He says, sir, that is all very well, but is there any way for us to let each other go home alive? I would be happy to hear of such a way if you can contrive one. At the moment, it seems to me that one of us must be killed. The atmosphere was of confusion. There were too many questions to be answered all at once. Nobody could answer any of them, and all of them had to be answered. The Londobon could start for home. The alien ship might or might not be able to multiply the speed of light by one more unit than the Earth vessel. If it could, the Londobon would get close enough to Earth to reveal its destination and then have to fight. It might or might not win. Even if it did win, the aliens might have a communications system by which the Londobon's destination might have been reported to the aliens' home planet before battle was joined. But the Londobon might lose in such a fight. If she was to be destroyed, it would be better to be destroyed here, without giving any clue to where human beings might be found by a forewarned, forearmed alien battle fleet. The black ship was in exactly the same predicament. It, too, could start for home. But the Londobon might be faster, and an overdrive field can be trailed if you set to work on it soon enough. The aliens also would not know whether the Londobon could report to its home base without returning. If the alien was to be destroyed, it also would prefer to fight it out here so that it could not lead a probable enemy to its own civilization. Neither ship, then, could think of flight. The course of the Lanvabon into the nebula might be known to the black ship, but it had been the end of a logarithmic curve, and the aliens could not know its properties. They could not tell from what direction the Earth ship had started. As of the moment, then, the two ships were even. But the question was, and remained, what now? There was no specific answer. The aliens traded information for information and did not always realize what information they gave. The humans traded information for information, and Tommy Dort sweated blood in his anxiety not to give any clue to the whereabouts of Earth. The aliens saw by infrared light and the vision plates and scanners in the robot communication exchange had to adapt their respective images up and down an optical octave each for them to have any meaning at all. It did not occur to the aliens that their eyesight told that their sun was a red dwarf, yielding light of greatest energy just below the part of the spectrum visible to human eyes. But after that fact was realized on the Lanvabon, it was realized that the aliens, too, should be able to deduce the sun's spectral type by the light to which men's eyes were best adapted. There was a gadget for the recording of shortwave trains which was as casually in use among the aliens as a sound recorder is among men. The humans wanted that, badly, and the aliens were fascinated by the mystery of sound. They were able to perceive noise, of course, just as a man's palm will perceive infrared light by the sensation of heat it produces but they could no more differentiate pitch or tone quality than a man is able to distinguish between two frequencies of heat radiation even half an octave apart. To them, the human science of sound was a remarkable discovery. They would find uses for noises which humans had never imagined, if they lived. But that was another question. Neither ship could leave without first destroying the other. But while the flood of information was in passage, neither ship could afford to destroy the other. There was the matter of the outer coloring of the two ships. The Lanvabon was mirror bright exteriorly. The alien ship was dead black by visible light. It absorbed heat to perfection and should radiate it away again as readily. But it did not. The black coating was not a black body color or lack of color. It was a perfect reflector of certain infrared wavelengths while simultaneously it fluoresced in just those wave bands. In practice, it absorbed the higher frequencies of heat, converted them to lower frequencies it did not radiate, and stayed at the desired temperature even in empty space.
in the book Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder, The Ultimate Guide to Symptoms, Treatment, and Prevention, you'll learn about obsessive compulsive personality disorder and how it can impact a person's life. This book covers a variety of topics, such as the subtypes of OCPD, symptoms of the disorder, as well as how to overcome it. If you're looking for a book to better understand how to identify the causes of obsessive compulsive personality disorder, we will explore it in this short book. After learning about the causes of OCPD, we'll dig deep into treatment methods and different types of therapy that are available for those suffering from the condition. Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder – The Ultimate Guide to Symptoms, Treatment, and Prevention by Clayton Jeffries, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Tommy Dort labored over his task of communications. He found the alien's thought process not so alien that he could not follow them. The discussion of technics reached the matter of interstellar navigation. A star map was needed to illustrate the process. It would have been logical to use a star map from the chart room, but from a star map one could guess the point from which the map was projected. Tommy had a map made specifically with imaginary but convincing star images upon it. He translated directions for its use by the coder and decoder. In return, the aliens presented a star map of their own before the visiplate. Copied instantly by photograph, the nav officers labored over it, trying to figure out from what spot in the galaxy the stars and Milky Way would show at such an angle. It baffled them. It was Tommy who realized finally that the aliens had made a special star map for their demonstration, too, and that it was a mirror image of the faked map Tommy had shown them previously. Tommy could grin at that. He began to like these aliens. They were not human, but they had a very human sense of the ridiculous. In course of time, Tommy essayed a mild joke. It had to be translated into code numerals, these into quite cryptic groups of shortwave frequency-modulated impulses and these went to the other ship and into heaven knew what to become intelligible. A joke, which went through such formalities, would not seem likely to be funny, but the aliens did see the point. There was one of the aliens to whom communication became as normal a function as Tommy's own code handlings. The two of them developed a quite insane friendship, conversing by coder, decoder, and shortwave trains. When technicalities in the official message grew too involved, that alien sometimes threw in strictly non-technical interpolations akin to slang. Often they cleared up the confusion. Tommy, for no reason whatsoever, had filed a code name of Buck, which the decoder picked out regularly when this particular operator signed his own symbol to a message. In the third week of communication, the decoder suddenly presented Tommy with a message in the message frame. You are a good guy. It is too bad we have to kill each other. Buck. Tommy had been thinking much the same thing. He tapped off the rueful reply. We can't see any way out of it. Can you? It was a pause, and the message frame filled up again. If we could believe each other, yes, our skipper would like it. But we can't believe you, and you can't believe us. We'd trail you home if we got a chance, and you'd trail us. But we feel sorry about it. Buck. Tommy Dort took the message to the skipper. Look here, sir, he said urgently. These people are almost human, and they're likable cusses. The skipper was busy about his important task of thinking things to worry about and worrying about them. He said tiredly, They're oxygen breathers. Their air is 28% oxygen instead of 20 but they could do very well on Earth. It'd be a highly desirable conquest for them, and we still don't know what weapons they've got or what they can develop. Would you tell them how to find Earth?" No, said Tommy unhappily. They probably feel the same way, said the skipper dryly, and if we did manage to make a friendly contact, how long would it stay friendly? If their weapons were inferior to ours, They'd feel that for their own safety they had to improve them. We, knowing they were planning to revolt, would crush them while we could. 
for our own safety. If it happened to be the other way around, they'd have to smash us before we could catch up to them. Tommy was silent, but he moved restlessly. If we smash this black ship and get home, said the skipper, Earth's government will be annoyed if we don't tell them where it came from. But what can we do? We'll be lucky enough to get back alive with our warning. It isn't possible to get out of those creatures any more information than we give them, and we surely won't give them our address. We've run into them by accident. Maybe if we smash this ship, there won't be another contact for thousands of years. And it's a pity, because trade can mean so much. But it takes two to make a peace, and we can't risk trusting them. The only answer is to kill them if we can, and if we can't, to make sure that when they kill us, they'll find out nothing that'll lead them to Earth. I don't like it, added the skipper tiredly, but there simply isn't anything else to do. On the Landebahn, the technicians worked frantically in two divisions. One prepared for victory, and the other for defeat. The ones working for victory could do little. The main blasters were the only weapons with any promise. Their mountings were cautiously altered so that they were no longer fixed nearly dead ahead with only a five-degree traverse. Electronic controls which followed a radio locator master finder would keep them trained with absolute precision upon a given target regardless of its maneuverings. More, a hitherto unsung genius in the engine room devised a capacity storage system by which the normal full output of the ship's engines could be momentarily accumulated and released in surges of stored power far above normal. In theory, the range of the blasters should be multiplied and their destructive power considerably stepped up. But there was not much more that could be done. The defeat crew had more leeway. Star charts, navigational instruments carrying telltale notations, the photographic record Tommy Dort had made on the six months' journey from Earth, and every other memorandum offering clues to Earth's position were prepared for destruction. They were put in sealed files, and if any one of them was opened by one who did not know the exact, complicated process, the contents of all the files would flash into ashes and the ashes be churned past any hope of restoration. Of course, if the Lanvaban should be victorious, a carefully not indicated method of reopening them in safety would remain. There were atomic bombs placed all over the hull of the ship. If its human crew should be killed without complete destruction of the ship, the atomic power bombs should detonate if the Lanvaban were brought alongside the alien vessel. There were no ready-made atomic bombs on board, but there were small, spare atomic power units on board. It was not hard to trick them so that when they were turned on, instead of yielding a smooth flow of power, they would explode. And four men of the Earth ship's crew remained always in spacesuits with closed helmets to fight the ship should it be punctured in many compartments by an unwarned attack. Such an attack, however, would not be treacherous. The alien skipper had spoken frankly. His manner was that of one who wryly admits the usefulness of lies. The skipper and the Lanvaban, in turn, heavily admitted the virtue of frankness. Each insisted, perhaps truthfully, that he wished for a friendship between the two races. But neither could trust the other not to make every conceivable effort to find out the one thing he needed most desperately to conceal, the location of his home planet and neither dared believe that the other was unable to trail him and find out, because each felt it his own duty to accomplish that unbearable, to the other, act, neither could risk the possible extinction of his race by trusting the other. They must fight because they could not do anything else. They could raise the stakes of the battle by an exchange of information beforehand, but there was a limit to the stake either would put up, no information on weapons, population, or resources would be given by either. Not even the distance of their home bases from the Crab Nebula would be told. They exchanged information, to be sure, but they knew a battle to the death must follow, and each strove to represent his own civilization as powerful enough to give pause to the other's ideas of possible conquest, and thereby increased its appearance of menace to the other and made battle more unavoidable. 
It was curious how completely such alien brains could mesh, however. Tommy Dort, sweating over the coding and decoding machines, found a personal equation emerging from the, at first, stilted arrays of word cards which arranged themselves. He had seen the aliens only in the vision screen, and then only in light at least one octave removed from the light they saw by. They, in turn, saw him very strangely, by transposed illumination from what to them would be the far ultraviolet. But their brains worked alike, amazingly alike. Tommy Dort felt an actual sympathy and even something close to friendship for the gill-breathing, bald, and dryly ironic creatures of the black space vessel. Because of that mental kinship, he set up, though hopelessly, a sort of table of the aspects of the problem before them. He did not believe that the aliens had any instinctive desire to destroy man. In fact, the study of communications from the aliens had produced on the Lombabon a feeling of tolerance, not unlike that between enemy soldiers during a truce on Earth. The men felt no enmity, and probably neither did the aliens, but they had to kill or be killed for strictly logical reasons. Tommy's table was specific. He made a list of objectives the men must try to achieve in the order of their importance. The first was the carrying back of news of the existence of the alien culture. The second was the location of that alien culture in the galaxy. The third was the carrying back of as much information as possible about that culture. The third was being worked on, but the second was probably impossible. The first, and all, would depend on the result of the fight which must take place. The aliens' objectives would be exactly similar, so that the men must prevent, first, news of the existence of Earth's culture from being taken back by the aliens, second, alien discovery of the location of Earth, and third, the acquiring by the aliens of information which would help them or encourage them to attack humanity. And again, the third was in train, and the second was probably taken care of, and the first must await the battle. There was no possible way to avoid the grim necessity of the destruction of the black ship. The aliens would see no solution to their problems but the destruction of the Lombabon. But Tommy Dort, regarding his tabulation ruefully, realized that even complete victory would not be a perfect solution. The ideal would be for the Lombabon to take back the alien ship for study. Nothing less would be a complete attainment of the third objective. But Tommy realized that he hated the idea of so complete a victory, even if it could be accomplished. He would hate the idea of killing even non-human creatures who understood a human joke. And beyond that, he would hate the idea of Earth fitting out a fleet of fighting ships to destroy an alien culture because its existence was dangerous. The pure accident of this encounter between peoples who could like each other had created a situation which could only result in wholesale destruction. Tommy Dort soured on his own brain which could find no answer which would work, but there had to be an answer. The gamble was too big. It was too absurd that two spaceships should fight, neither one primarily designed for fighting, so that the survivor could carry back news which would set one side to frenzied preparation for war against the unwarned other. If both races could be warned, though, and each knew that the other did not want to fight, and if they could communicate with each other but not locate each other until some grounds for mutual trust could be reached, it was impossible. It was chimerical. It was a daydream. It was nonsense. But it was such luring nonsense that Tommy Dort ruefully put it into the coder to his gill-breathing friend Buck then some hundred thousand miles off in the misty brightness of the nebula. Sure, said Buck, and the decoder's word cards flickering into place in the message frame, that is a good dream. But I like you and still won't believe you. If I said that first, you would like me but not believe me either. I tell you the truth more than you believe, and maybe you tell me the truth more than I believe. But there is no way to know. I am sorry." Tommy Dort stared gloomily at the message. He felt a very horrible sense of responsibility. Everyone did on the Lombabon. If they failed in this encounter, the human race would run a very good chance of being exterminated in time to come. If they succeeded, 
the race of the aliens would be the ones to face destruction most likely. Millions or billions of lives hung upon the actions of a few men. Then Tommy Dort saw the answer. It would be amazingly simple if it worked. At worst, it might give a partial victory to humanity and the Lanvabon. He sat quite still, not daring to move lest he break the chain of thought that followed the first tenuous idea. He went over and over it, excitedly finding objections here and meeting them and, and overcoming impossibilities there. It was the answer. He felt sure of it. He felt almost dizzy with relief when he found his way to the captain's room and asked to leave to speak. It is the function of a skipper, among others, to find things to worry about. But the Lanvabon's skipper did not have to look. In the three weeks and four days since the first contact with the alien black ship, the skipper's face had grown lined and old. He had not only the Lanvabon to worry about, he had all of humanity. Sir, said Tommy Dort, his mouth rather dry because of his enormous earnestness, may I offer a method of attack on the black ship? I'll undertake it myself, sir, and if it doesn't work, our ship won't be weakened. The skipper looked at him unseeingly. The tactics are all worked out, Mr. Dort, he said heavily. They're being cut on tape now for the ship's handling. It's a terrible gamble, but it has to be done. I think, said Tommy carefully, I've worked out a way to take the gamble out. Suppose, sir, we send a message to the other ship offering... His voice went on in the utterly quiet captain's room, with the visiplates showing only a vast mistiness outside and the two fiercely burning stars in the nebula's heart. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about, the perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous, original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one, but there is. Your Bigfoot Expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same the perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. The skipper himself went through the airlock with Tommy. For one reason, the action Tommy had suggested would need his authority behind it. For another, the skipper had worried more intensively than anybody else on the Lon Vibon, and he was tired of it. If he went with Tommy, he would do the thing himself, and if he failed, he would be the first one killed, and the tapes for the Earth's ship maneuvering were already fed into the control board and correlated with the master timer. If Tommy and the skipper were killed, a single control pushed home would throw the Lon Vibon into the most furious possible all-out attack which would end in the complete destruction of one ship or the other, or both. So the skipper was not deserting his post. The outer airlock door swung wide. It opened upon that shining emptiness which was the nebula. Twenty miles away, the little round robot hung in space, drifting in an incredible orbit about the twin central suns and floating ever nearer and nearer. It would never reach either of them, of course, the white star alone was so much hotter than Earth's sun that its heat effect would produce Earth's temperature on an object five times as far from it as Neptune is from Sol. Even removed to the distance of Pluto, the little robot would be raised to cherry-red heat by the blazing white dwarf. 
and it could not possibly approach to the 90-odd million miles which is the Earth's distance from the Sun. So near, its metal would melt and boil away as vapor. But half a light year out, the bulbous object bobbed in emptiness. The two space-suited figures soared away from the Lanvaban. The small atomic drives which made them minute spaceships on their own had been subtly altered, but the change did not interfere with their functioning. They headed for the communication robot. The skipper, out in space, said gruffly, Mr. Dort, all my life I have longed for adventure. This is the first time I could ever justify it to myself. His voice came through Tommy's space phone receivers. Tommy wetted his lips and said, It doesn't seem like adventure to me, sir. I want terribly for the plan to go through. I thought adventure was when you didn't care. Oh, no, said the skipper. Adventure is when you toss your life on the scales of chance and wait for the pointer to stop. They reached the round object. They clung to its short, scanner-tipped horns. Intelligent, those creatures, said the skipper heavily. They must want desperately to see more of our ship than the communications room to agree to this exchange of visits before the fight. Yes, sir, said Tommy. But privately he suspected that Buck, his gill-breathing friend, would like to see him in the flesh before one or both of them died and it seemed to him that between the two ships had grown up an odd tradition of courtesy, like that between two ancient knights before a tourney, when they admired each other wholeheartedly before hacking at each other with all the contents of their respective armories. They waited. Then, out of the mist, came two other figures. The alien spacesuits were also power-driven. The aliens themselves were shorter than men, and their helmet openings were coated with a filtering material to cut off visible and ultraviolet rays which to them would be lethal. It was not possible to see more than the outline of the heads within. Tommy's helmet phone said from the communications room on the Lanvaban, "'They say that their ship is waiting for you, sir. The airlock door will be open.' The skipper's voice said heavily, "'Mr. Dort.' Have you seen their spacesuits before? If so, are you sure that they're not carrying anything extra, such as bombs?" Yes, sir, said Tommy. We've showed each other our space equipment. They've nothing but regular stuff in view, sir. The skipper made a gesture to the two aliens. He and Tommy Dort plunged on to the black vessel. They could not make out the ship very clearly with the naked eye, but directions for change of course came from the communications room the black ship loomed up. It was huge, as long as the Lanvaban and vastly thicker. The airlock did stand open. The two space-suited men moved in and anchored themselves with magnetic-soled boots. The outer door closed. There was a rush of air and, simultaneously, the sharp, quick tug of artificial gravity. Then the inner door opened. All was darkness. Tommy switched on his helmet light at the same instant as the skipper. Since the aliens saw by infrared and white light would have been intolerable to them. The men's helmet lights were, therefore, of the deep red tint used to illuminate instrument panels so there will be no dazzling of eyes that must be able to detect the minutest specks of white light on a navigation vision plate. There were aliens waiting to receive them. They blinked at the brightness of the helmet lights. The space phone receivers said in Tommy's ear, "'They say, sir, their skipper is waiting for you.' Tommy and the skipper were in a long corridor with a soft flooring underfoot. Their lights showed details of which every one was exotic. "'I think I'll crack my helmet, sir,' said Tommy. He did. The air was good. By analysis, it was 30% oxygen instead of 20 for normal air on Earth, but the pressure was less it felt just right. The artificial gravity, too, was less than that maintained on the Lanvaban. The home planet of the aliens would be smaller than Earth and, by the infrared data, circling close to a nearly dead, dull red sun. The air had smells in it. They were utterly strange but not unpleasant. An arched opening, a ramp with the same soft stuff underfoot, lights which actually shed a dim, dull red glow about. The aliens had stepped up some of their illuminating equipment as an act of courtesy. 
the light might hurt their eyes, but it was a gesture of consideration, which made Tommy even more anxious for his plan to go through. The alien skipper faced them, with what seemed to Tommy a gesture of wryly humorous deprecation. The helmet phones said, He says, sir, that he greets you with pleasure, but he has been able to think of only one way in which the problem created by the meeting of these two ships can be solved. He means a fight, said the skipper. Tell him I'm here to offer another choice. The Lombobon's skipper and the skipper of the alien ship were face to face, but their communications were weirdly indirect. The aliens used no sound in communication. Their talk, in fact, took place on microwaves and approximated telepathy. But they could not hear in any ordinary sense of the word, so the skipper's and Tommy's speech approached telepathy, too, as far as they were concerned. When the skipper spoke, his space phone sent his words back to the Lonvabon, where the words were fed into the coder and shortwave equivalents sent back to the black ship. The alien skipper's reply went to the Lonvabon and through the decoder and was retransmitted by space phone in words read from the message frame. It was awkward, but it worked. The short and stocky alien skipper paused. The helmet phones relayed his translated, soundless reply. He is anxious to hear, sir. The skipper took off his helmet. He put his hands at his belt in a belligerent pose. Look here he said truculently to the bald, strange creature in an unearthly red glow before him. It looks like we have to fight and one batch of us get killed. We're ready to do it if we have to, but if you win, we've got it fixed so you'll never find out where Earth is and there's a good chance we'll get you anyhow. If we win, we'll be in the same fix. And if we win and go back home, our government will fit out a fleet and start hunting your planet and if we find it, we'll be ready to blast it to hell. If you win, the same thing will happen to us. And it's all foolishness. We've stayed here a month, and we've swapped information, and we don't hate each other. There's no reason for us to fight except for the rest of our respective races." The skipper stopped for breath, scowling. Tommy Dort inconspicuously put his own hands on the belt of his spacesuit. He waited hoping desperately that the trick would work. "'He says, sir,' reported the helmet phones, "'that all you say is true, but that his race has to be protected, just as you feel that yours must be.' "'Naturally,' said the skipper angrily, "'but the sensible thing to do is to figure out how to protect it. Putting his future up as a gamble in a fight is not sensible. Our races have to be warned of each other's existence, that's true.' but each should have proof that the other doesn't want to fight, but wants to be friendly. And we shouldn't be able to find each other, but we should be able to communicate with each other to work out grounds for a common trust. If our governments want to be fools, let them. But we should give them the chance to make friends, instead of starting a space war out of mutual funk." Briefly, the space phone said, He says that the difficulty is that of trusting each other now. With the possible existence of his race at stake, he cannot take any chance, and neither can you, of yielding an advantage." But my race, boomed the skipper, glaring at an alien captain, my race has an advantage now. We came here to your ship in atom-powered spacesuits. Before we left, we altered the drives. We can set off ten pounds of sensitized fuel apiece right here in this ship or it can be set off by remote control from our ship. It will be rather remarkable if your fuel store doesn't blow up with us. In other words, if you don't accept my proposal for a common-sense approach to this predicament, Dort and I blow up in an atomic explosion and your ship will be wrecked if not destroyed, and the Lonvabon will be attacking with everything it's got within two seconds after the blast goes off. The captain's room of the alien ship was a strange scene, with its dull red illumination and the strange, bald, gill-breathing aliens watching the skipper and waiting for the inaudible translation of the harangue they could not hear. But a sudden tensity appeared in the air, a sharp, savage feeling of strain. The alien skipper made a gesture, the helmet phones hummed. He says, sir, what is your proposal? Swap ships, roared the skipper. 
swap ships and go on home. We can fix our instruments so they'll do no trailing, he can do the same with his. We'll each remove our star maps and records. We'll each dismantle our weapons. The air will serve and we'll take their ship and they'll take ours and neither one can harm or trail the other and each will carry home more information than can be taken otherwise. We can agree on this same crab nebula as a rendezvous when the double star has made another circuit and if our people want to meet them, they can do it, and if they're scared, they can duck it. That's my proposal, and he'll take it, or Dort and I blow up their ship and the Lanvabond blasts what's left." He glared about him while he waited for the translation to reach the tense, small, stocky figures about him. He could tell when it came because the tenseness changed. The figures stirred. They made gestures. One of them made convulsive movements. It lay down on the soft floor and kicked. Others leaned against its walls and shook. The voice in Tommy Dort's helmet phones had been strictly crisp and professional before, but now it sounded blankly amazed. He said, sir, that's a good joke, because the two members he sent to our ship and that you passed on the way have their spacesuits stuffed with atomic explosive too, sir, and he intended to make the very same offer and threat. Of course, he accepts, sir. Your ship is worth more to him than his own, and he's worth more to you than the Lanvabon. It appears, sir, to be a deal." Then Tommy Dort realized what the convulsive movements of the aliens were. They were laughter. It wasn't quite as simple as the skipper had outlined it. The actual working out of the proposal was complicated. For three days, the crews of the two ships were intermingled the aliens learning the workings of the Lanvabon's engines, and the men learning the controls of the black spaceship. It was a good joke, but it wasn't all a joke. There were men on the black ship and aliens on the Lanvabon, ready at an instant's notice to blow up the vessel in question. And they would have done it in case of need, for which reason the need did not appear. But it was actually a better arrangement to have two expeditions return to two civilizations under the current arrangement than for either to return alone. There were differences, though. There was some dispute about the removal of records. In most cases, the dispute was settled by the destruction of the records. There was more trouble caused by the Lanvabon's books and the alien equivalent of a ship's library containing works which approximated the novels of Earth, but those items were valuable to possible friendship because they would show the two cultures, each to the other, from the viewpoint of normal citizens and without propaganda. But nerves were tense during those three days. Aliens unloaded and inspected the foodstuffs intended for the men on the black ship. Men transshipped the foodstuffs the aliens would need to return to their home. There were endless details, from the exchange of lighting equipment to suit the eyesight of the exchanging crews, to a final checkup of apparatus. A joint inspection party of both races verified that all detector devices had been smashed but not removed so that they could not be used for trailing and had not been smuggled away. And of course, the aliens were anxious not to leave any useful weapons on the black ship nor the men upon the Lanvabon. It was a curious fact that each crew was best qualified to take exactly the measures which made an evasion of the agreement impossible. There was a final conference before the two ships parted, back in the communications room of the Lanvabon. "'Tell the little runt,' rumbled the Lanvabon's former skipper, "'that he's got a good ship, and he'd better treat her right.'" The message frame flicked word cards into position. "'I believe,' it said on the alien skipper's behalf, "'that your ship is just as good. I will hope to meet you here when the double star has turned one turn.'" The last man left the Lanvabon. It moved away into a misty nebula before they had returned to the black ship. The vision plates in that vessel had been altered for human eyes, and human crewmen watched jealously for any trace of their former ship as their new craft took a crazy, evading course to a remote part of the nebula. It came to a crevice of nothingness, leading to the stars. It rose swiftly to clear space. There was the instant of breathlessness which the overdrive field produces as it goes on, 
and the black ship whipped away into the void at many times the speed of light. Many days later, the skipper saw Tommy Dort poring over one of the strange objects which were the equivalent of books. It was fascinating to puzzle over. The skipper was pleased with himself. The technicians of the Londobon's former crew were finding out desirable things about the ship almost momently. Doubtless the aliens were as pleased with their discoveries in the Londobon that the black ship would be enormously worthwhile, and the solution that had been found was by any standard much superior even to a combat in which the Earthmen had been overwhelmingly victorious. Hmm, Mr. Dort, said the skipper profoundly, you've no equipment to make another photographic record on the way back. It was left on the Londobon. But fortunately, we have your record taken on the way out, and I shall report most favorably on your suggestion and your assistance in carrying it out. I think very well of you, sir." "'Thank you, sir,' said Tommy Dort. He waited. The skipper cleared his throat. <clears> throat> "'You uh, uh, first realized the close similarity of mental processes between the aliens and ourselves,' he observed. "'What do you think of the prospects of a friendly agreement if we keep a rendezvous with them at the Nebula as agreed?' "'Oh, we'll get along all right, sir,' said Tommy. We got a good start towards friendship. After all, since they see by infrared, the planets they'd want to make use of wouldn't suit us. There's no reason why we shouldn't get along. We're almost alike in psychology." Hmm, now, just what do you mean by that? demanded the skipper. Why, they're just like us, sir, said Tommy. Of course, they breathe through gills and they see by heat waves, and their blood has a copper base instead of iron, and a few little details like that, but otherwise we're just alike. There were only men in their crew, sir, but they have two sexes, as we have, and they have families and uh, their sense of humor, in fact." Tommy hesitated. "'Go on, sir,' said the skipper. "'Well, there was the one I called Buck, sir, because he hadn't any name that goes into sound waves,' said Tommy. "'We got along very well. I'd really call him my friend, sir, and we were together for a couple of hours just before the two ships separated and we'd nothing in particular to do, so I became convinced that humans and aliens are bound to be good friends if they only have half a chance. You see, sir, we spent those two hours telling dirty jokes. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more. You can also join the show's Weirdos Facebook group on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. If you have a true tale to tell, click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. Stories on Thriller Thursday episodes are works of fiction, and links to the stories or the authors can be found in the show notes. First Contact was written by Murray Leinster for Astounding Science Fiction magazine. Weird Darkness is a production of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness 2021. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. James 2, verse 17. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And a final thought from George Eliot, which was the pen name of Mary Ann Evans. It is never too late to be what you might have been. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.